Yeah, ready? Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to the ICANX Talks. Uh, we're uh, delighted to have a, a really wonderful uh, program for you today. Uh, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Yes, I'm uh, Paul Weiss at UCLA and co-host with Alice Shang and uh, Lan Fu and Martin Tuo of the ICANX Talks. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide. We have a, a program this month in nanomaterials and a very special uh, speaker today. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so first I'm delighted to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kostya Novoselov, who's now a professor at the Center for Advanced 2D Materials at the National University of Singapore and is also the Langworthy Professor in the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Manchester. He's a fellow of the Royal Society and the US National Academy of Sciences. He's been knighted in the Netherlands and Britain. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2010, and he was Geek of the Week on the Big Bang Theory. He's also a gracious and wonderful scholar and person who thinks deeply about the future of materials. It's our honor to have him with us today. Uh, he'll be giving us a talk and then we'll follow that with a panel and I'll introduce our panelists after the talk. Uh, Kostya, the floor is yours. Great, uh, Paul, thank you so much for, for your kind introduction. So it's really, uh, really exciting and a uh, great privilege to be at this, uh, at this uh, seminar. So it's, it, it has, of course, a very strong pedigree already and uh, a bit nervous if I can contribute. So especially knowing that the, the audience is vast. So, so um, I'll try to tune to different parts of the audience uh, as we uh, as we speak and um, and uh, I also try to go through uh, a little bit of a, of a history but mainly focusing on, on what we have been busy in the last uh, two three four years and probably uh, if I have time I'll touch a little bit uh, to uh, to the topic which we're busy with uh, right now so um, uh, so the um, um, the topic uh, which we which which we work on or we have been working on, uh, on over the last few years is one of our heterostructures, and it is a sort of in between uh, uh, the uh, the history of two D materials and the 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 future what 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 we are working on, but uh, nevertheless I would like to. To start with the with the very basics, with um, uh, with with uh, with graphene, uh, clearly everybody. Uh, I'm sure that in the audience, everyone knows what is what is what is graphene is the uh, world uh, thinnest, probably world simplest material as well. It's only uh, uh, it's two dimensional sheet of of carbon atoms arranged in in uh, hexagonal lattice. And the fact that it is carbon and the fact that this uh, uh, honeycomb lattice, it really gives uh, this material very, very unique properties. So, of course, uh, we all hear that it's the strongest material. It's also the most conductive, means that it can support the highest density of, of current, most uh, thermally conductive, impermeable, uh, stretchable, and, and, and so on and so on. And so on, and of course, um, since long, um, since long, uh, it, it was, it has been. Uh, uh, people try to to use it for a variety of of different applications, from say energy to sensors, from composite materials to printable uh, printable electronics. But actually, what is Really uh, exciting is not only that it has all those all, all those unique properties. So some other materials have unique properties, but really that uh, all those properties are combined in one uh, in one material. So it has not only unique properties; it has the unique combination of properties as well. And I think it is still. Uh, it, it's still to come uh, those applications which were not possible before because we didn't have such a material and which will be allowed 
by by graphene where exactly the combination of those of those of those properties is going to, to be required but uh, so far um, uh, if we just leave aside the 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 future if we look at how applications of graphene have been developing well it's actually uh, even though graphene is very special to to us and to to my heart and to I'm sure to many researchers across across the globe when it comes to the uh, real life applications surprisingly it follows exactly the footsteps which was paved by uh, many other uh, materials before it like for example uh, uh, carbon fibers or carbon nanotubes so you, you could really it's like almost a blueprint from the from uh, set up by those advanced materials and they all follow the same foot, uh, footsteps so they exactly they start with uh, applications in 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 composites generally starting with some sport goods where you can pay premium for small minute uh, improvements uh, ourselves we work with richard miller and mclaren to create this world lightest unfortunately world most expensive watch it's one million swiss franc for 32 grams of, of of weight but definitely by far the most expensive pure gram uh, but uh, and really here the uh, the improvements in uh, in in properties are really are really minor few percent so it's really it's uh, it's it's difficult to say where the uh, the marketing stops and where the real uh, improvement starts but then as as things developed uh, we've been working with um, uh, other companies who who've been utilizing graphene for 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 other reasons for example we work with this uh, small car manufacturer from um, nearby uh, liverpool who used graphene in the composite panels in the in this in this car and it's it's the fastest road worthy car so you can ride this on the on the road and these days they use graphene for all their panels and the the reason is not actually that it makes them uh, lightweight or it, it makes them stronger but it's uh, it, it's in fact allows you to uh, cool down and speed up the process of the of the uh, of the uh, composite material preparation uh, quite quite dramatically so and speeding up the the production process for for those companies mean mean money so they so uh, it basically they use graphene for its thermal conductivity rather than for for uh, anything else and um so uh, the so there are other similar examples when people started to use uh, or try to use graphene for some basic applications and they figure it out that some other properties would would uh, would get 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 improved for example uh, these days pretty much every single uh, ford car uh, uses graphene under its bonnet in the plastic panels and they use it for uh, noise absorption properties. So from the hindsight, you would probably guess that if you have a 2D material, you've got a lot of the of the uh, interfaces which can scatter phonons, and you can uh, you can um, in, in improve the uh, noise absorption. But um, of course, it took quite quite some time for Ford engineers to come with those uh, with uh, with those materials and then we go from noise absorption to the noise creation so there are uh, there is this uh, startup company from from canada who uh, who utilizes graphene for uh for um uh for the membranes in in the in their headphones and so for, the, for those membranes which which produce sound in the headphones well, the requirements for them that they need to be very light so they can oscillate at, at very very high frequency and they should be stiff as well so they can uh, they uh, they won't create any any harmonics and so stiff and light that's all that's all uh, all graphene of course so that's uh, so it was quite a, 
uh, quite an, an intuition and it's a, it's quite a successful project and then we go to more to more uh, uh, to more um, electronic like applications of course these days most of the Huawei uh, devices do use graphene for for thermal management so the uh, the graphene paper uh, produced these days we've got thermal conductivity above uh, 1.2 uh, 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 1.2 thousand watt per per meter Kelvin, and uh, and that's uh, that's really quite impressive, and uh, and it, this this number keep growing as we improve the quality of those of those of those graphene components which we uh, which we can prepare. So in this case, it is being prepared from uh, reduced uh, graphene oxide. So another another interesting uh, bit nurse application, but already quite widespread, is the use uh, graphene oxide grown on on silicon carbide. I will later very briefly uh, describe the the methods which we use to produce to 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 produce graphene, and uh, and. Um, so one of the methods is the is to is to evaporate silicon from silicon carbide, and the uh, the remaining carbon uh, gets re gets rearranged into uh, in, in, into graphene films. And the interesting story here that charge is being is being shared between silicon carbide and and the graphene film here, and because of that, uh, the quantum hole plotters become very very flat and very very uh, very broad in magnetic field so uh, people use it as a resistance standard for uh, uh, in uh, in various meteorological institutes so at least in uh, in um, uh, uk and in in france people switched from uh, gallium masonite to those to those graphene samples which allows you to to use very high temperatures like 0.3 Kelvin, which is uh, well, even even high in, in principle. Uh, so definitely, you don't need uh, dilution fridges and a quite modest magnetic field of the order of three Tesla. So it becomes very portable, very portable device. And then more towards uh, towards uh, uh, real electronic applications. So one of the one of the success stories is the uh, creation of the uh, photovoltaic devices, photo detectors based on graphene and quantum dots. And here, uh, because of the high mobility of graphene and, and, and the fact that you can use, you can utilize pretty much any quantum dots you want, you can, you get extremely high uh, sensitivity, but also you can tune this, the uh, sensitivity range to uh, to any uh, any wavelengths, any any optical or infrared or even UV range you uh, you want. So uh, especially uh, important uh, for um, for autonomous vehicles where you need a number of 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 different sensors for different wavelengths in the same in the same setup. So that's all can be quite easily done in such uh, in such systems. And of course, I think what is most promising, though, we still it still have to be seen whether it's it is graphene or maybe some other two D materials. Is the is the use is of the combination between graphene and the and uh, and silicon um, wave guides for the modulation of the optical signal. So these days, of course, we are trying to move from the electronic modulation uh, electronic. Um, data processing to to all all optical because uh, all the transmission of, of our internet signal is uh, is through the through the optical fiber so it's much better if we could uh, if we could uh, do some modulation and some signal uh, signal processing inside of the inside of those uh, in the optical domains and the use of gra of graphene and other 2d crystals actually helps you helps you with that and maybe something which is more exotic but i think it will it will have a lot of a lot of 
impact uh, in the future is to think about 2D materials and graphene as um, a, as a perfect membrane where you can, um, which is generally impermeable to 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 any atoms, but at the same time you can uh, modify these these um, these crystals so that they would be uh, permeable to selective species or of uh, molecular or, or or even ionic or atomic species. And uh, so there were reports about uh, you can make how we can make selective uh, selective uh, sieves through uh, through this, but also um, uh, also um, you can use it for water purification and uh, and so on. So as I said, I'll I'll say just a couple of words about the mass production of uh, of 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 graphene. For the uh, for for real life applications, of course, some time ago we started with um, the scotch tape technique, where you simply take graphite, take scotch tape, and split graphite into into thin uh, thin flakes, thin layers. Um, so graphite is the material which is found in your in your lead pencils. Of course, it's better if you use the high the high quality crystal uh, crystal graphite though uh, though in principle you can use pencils as well so we, I've done it uh, I've done it before uh, but of course you could guess that it's not very sustainable method at all even though we still use it in the lab and it works it works well uh, but at the same time these days depending on the price you want to pay and the quality you want to you, you want to achieve you can use Many other methods, for example, the electronic grade, uh, grade, grade uh, uh, graphene uh, you can get from um, from uh, CVD methods, where where you basically run uh, carbon containing gas on top of a surface of uh, of a hot metal. This uh, this gas gas molecules crack on the on the surface hydrogen flies away and the remaining carbon just uh, just rearranges itself uh, itself uh, on the on the surface um, so in principle you can use pretty much any any uh, any material any carbon containing material um, uh, for this for this purpose uh, so um, uh, it just it just uh, sh show you as a sort of a, a, an example, a joke how what what we were how we were trying to create a graphene dot with with iron. I doubt you can guess what it is. So it's basically you take your 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 blood, spread it on on copper, stick it into the oven, and then you get uh, graphene possibly doped with with iron. I should say the quality which we managed to get. Is not is not very high though it's uh, it's still it's still conductive it's, uh, so it, it does work and students don't need to worry so those those were my my fingers my blood so uh, I don't I don't ask every single student in the lab to donate blood into uh, for the sake of uh, of science don't worry so um, and then there is um, liquid phase exfoliation which you, uh, which is basically akin to the mechanical exfoliation but you use van der Waals uh, forces mainly uh, for the for the splitting of the of those of those layers uh, so it's used for to for for the production of graphene for printable electronics composites energy some some bio and then as i mentioned there are several epitaxial techniques as well where we can grow graphene on the surface of different crystals. So this work was so, so it was more or less as a sort of an, an, an a general introduction. And the next step goes goes like this: that uh, that if you have um, if you have if you can make graphene from lead pencils, uh, why won't you uh, try? The other pencils as well, and uh, can you? The question is, can you get anything else out of uh, out of other pencils? The answer is yes, you can. You can actually create many other uh, two-dimensional crystals. They all share the same the same um, the same property that they're only one 
atom or one unit cell thick, but at the same time they would uh, they would be uh, they would have they would possess very different physical properties. So we have so these days we have many dozens of different two D crystals available to us, and I think people work like regularly with I don't know ten papers on quantum matter every day with uh, with probably a good dozen two dozens of different of different of different crystals uh, and uh, they really cover a huge range of properties from the most insulating like uh, boron nitride for example with the uh, band gap of 6 eV to some uh, semiconducting to semi-metals metals uh, there are ferromagnets there are superconductors so basically the range of those of those crystals is huge um, and maybe just let me make a, a brief uh, midway or whatever one third way um, uh, just break entertainment i'll just tell you tell you a story so this is a uh, this is the national graphene institute which we may which we created in manchester a few a few years ago that's the the building how it looks how it looks now uh, so very busy Two floors of the clean rooms plus uh, plus dedicated uh, dedicated labs for a number of different types of experiments. But that's how it looked. What maybe seven years ago when we started our archaeological survey. And of course, in England, when you start the archaeological survey, you 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 pray you don't get into some sort of Roman remains that uh, no one would stop the the. Uh, the construction. We were lucky. There wasn't any any Romans at that, at that exactly place, but we just got into the uh, remains of some terrace houses from the beginning of Industrial Revolution in Manchester. But also the remains of a fairly large building over here, which was identified as an Albert Clubhouse. And Albert Clubhouse uh, at that time served what well, was established uh, early in the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and. It's, it was it served as the uh, German uh, German experts club and uh, we probably won't remember much about it but this gentleman was the member of the club it's uh, it's angles and similarly like uh, the uh, communist manifesto wasn't wasn't uh, written by angles alone it would be stupid to only do graphene in graphene building so we actually try to work on many different other, other materials as well. So, uh, and why uh, why it is important to 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 work on different materials, but maybe also why is it important to have uh, a range of different two D crystals? And again, a bit of the background. So, generally, materials are very important for uh, for humanity. We even call the ages we live in by the names of those materials, like Stone Age, like the Iron Age, the Bronze Age, and uh, a good question: uh, which age do we live in in now? And um, well, you, uh, it's probably for the first time in history that we've got a choice. So we can you can call it the the digital age, or maybe the silicon age, or the nuclear age. And but it's important to make a smart choice because. If you're really bad on a, on the, on the wrong material, it's um, uh, it's you, you it might lead to quite uh, unforeseen consequences. So here is an example of the uh, periodic table of elements which we used in the uh, uh, our silicon technology prior to 1990. Like uh, very, you see, we only use what six six elements. So silicon. Itself, boron, phosphorus for interconnect, sorry, for doping, aluminium for interconnect, hydrogen, oxygen for passivation. Very simple technology. So, uh, I mean, anyone can do it. Past 1990, we started to use copper interconnect. So, we had to uh, make the uh, technology a little bit more complex because we need the diffusion barrier, you need to match the work from function for the context, but still still manageable. These days, 
we really use more than half of the periodic table for our silicon technology. And that's really, that's really, um, that's really worrying because uh, what basically happens is that we got a brilliant, brilliant silicon technology, which was effective and simple and, uh, and productive and we keep adapting it and the more we adapt it the more we invest and the more it is difficult to diverge from it and at, at the end of the day you basically find yourself that investments into silicon are so large that we are basically the slaves of this of this technology and we cannot we simply cannot escape from it uh, never probably probably never so so and but at the same time it doesn't grow with the speed which we want because if you compare the complexity of the integrated circuits and the complexity of the human body at least in terms of the number of elements which we use you would find that we have less elements in the human body and uh, much more in the integrated circuits but in terms of the productivity and the uh, and the effectiveness i think you would agree with me that the situation is the the other way around so our, our brain is by far more effective in terms of energy consumption for example than uh, than any of those integrated integrated circuits so and that's that's the general message that we really uh, don't want to get into into um a slavery of any any one material you want to be able to have a platform which allows you to tune the properties of those materials quite fast and quite efficiently and and that's where the the 2d crystals can can possibly help because uh of course it's really it's really exciting to study the properties of those of those two 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 d materials in their own right because the physics in two in two dimensions always uh, often very different from the physics in 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 3d but at the same time uh, it, it it offers you a, a possibility of creation of new uh, new crystals which do not exist in nature and you can do it simply by stacking those uh, 2d crystals together into a three-dimensional stack and uh, you basically can combine different crystals you can uh you can choose different thickness of of the individual individual materials and you create uh, a 3d stack with the atomic precision and then you can encode very very different properties and very different functionalities into into uh, such a stack and over the years there have been uh, uh there have been examples of many different devices and many different effects which were obtained uh, in such uh, in such crystals in such materials so really if you think that so any two-dimensional sheet of of uh, 2d crystal is uh, uh, is like a, a page which is which has a story written in it which is that which are the properties of those materials really if you put those pages together you can write a whole novel and of course you can tell many more interesting things in, in the novel than than in in one single single crystal and that's the that's just illustrates the power of the of this of this technology and generally um uh, uh the quality of such uh such crystallized such uh materials can be very high so here is the example of the material uh, which we build on on the top of the uh, of hexagonal boron nitride when we added two layers of graphene then two layers of boron nitride graphene boron nitride and then graphene again and especially if you look at the uh, at the uh, dark field image you probably won't be able to say where your bulk BN stops and where your uh, your uh, your uh, your graphing uh, starts so the quality can be very high the efficiency can be very high so here is the complexity can be very high so here is the example of the uh, 2d um, of the um, uh, uh, led based on one of on, on such a heterostructure so graphene here plays really a secondary role on this. so there is there, there are those layers um uh, layers in uh, uh, the top and, and the bottom so it plays only the role 
of the of the transparent uh, conductor. Here, the, the major role is played by the uh, semiconducting layers, which uh, act as uh, quantum wells, where you inject electrons and holes from different directions, from different contexts, and then they recombine and can and can emit light. And because uh, because we have quite quite a, a variety of those of those two D crystals available to us, also the uh, also the um, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, operating range in terms of the wavelengths the uh, it can be can be very different. Interestingly, it can also get into the silicon telecom telecom range of about one um, 1.2 uh, ed where with uh, um, with little they tell right and and uh, there you can actually so it's 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 really important because there are no uh, uh, you cannot create um, you cannot emit light in those there are no materials which emit light uh, in, in in the region which can be easily coupled with silicon technology 2d technology of course can be easily coupled with uh, silicon photonic technology but now uh, let me just uh, switch gears and get to the uh, well real physics uh, part of the talk and um the story goes like this that uh, okay we so to create such heterostructures we can combine different different crystals together we can use different thickness of those of those crystals uh, as well but uh, also what uh, also interestingly you can actually control the uh, the uh, the orientational uh, the ordering uh, the relative orientation between neighboring neighboring crystals so you can when you assemble this stack you can actually rotate those those, those crystals in the uh, in, uh, in 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 the real space and of course if you rotate it in the real space you would rotate them in the in the reciprocal space as well and if you rotate them in the reciprocal space then you can you 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 you, you start getting some some interesting effects even in the very very simple case where you only couple those those crystals only uh, only weakly so you put a thick layer of boron nitride in between and you create a tunneling device when you need to go from one graphene layer to another through a tunneling layer and if the uh, crystallographic orientations of those two crystals are, uh, are the same or closely the same you get you already get some very unusual characteristics so uh, so the, this is the IV IV characteristics what is special about about it that Ohm's law tells you that it should um, the current should follow voltage so it should it should go up as you as you increase uh, the the applied voltage here clearly current first go up and then uh, and then quite sharply quite abruptly uh, start to go down and so-called negative differential resistance um, the effect which is quite highly uh, thought after uh, in 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 many uh, uh, for many electronic devices because you can allow on this negative uh, negative parts negative resistance but you can generate high high frequency signal you get some instabilities and in 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 such system you get it for free in a very very simple simple device and uh, especially what is beautiful is that the explanation of this effect you can ask me later uh, how to how to explain it you, you uh, the explanation of this of this effect is purely purely geometrical so it's really it's really a beauty but generally it just shows us that the relative orientation of crystals when we assemble them into uh, into devices is uh, is extremely important is uh, we uh, so those heterostructures they are very 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 sensitive to the uh, to the assembly of the of the uh, uh, to the uh, orientational assembly of those of those crystals. Well, let me just give you give you one example, one 
probably the most simple example you can you can imagine. Imagine you study not a monolayer graphene but a trilayer graphene. So and trilayer graphene you can when you start putting crystals on top of each other. Uh, you would immediately figure out that this trilayer graphene can exist in two different uh, two different configuration. One is uh, so-called ABA staking, or the the Bernal staking, when the the third layer is right exactly on top of the on top of the of the bottom one. Or you can get uh, so-called rhombohedral staking, the ABC staking. When the third layer is uh, is is offset from the uh, from the uh, from the bottom one by half of the half of the unit cell, and so that's it. It's uh, the same material, three layers. All we've done is just moved the top layer by by one unit cell uh, uh, away, and immediately you will get dramatically different properties so the uh, the uh, you get you, uh, you get uh, semi metallic behavior for the bernal stacked uh, graphene and you you, you get a topological insulator behavior for so with the insulating bulk and uh, and uh, surface uh, surface channels surface states uh, for the uh, for the for the trilayer Trilayer graphene, and that really um, pushed. So this idea of the uh, orientational stacking really pushed uh, pushed quite a number of different devices to be created, and uh, so it started a long time ago with the uh, basic combination of boron nitride and 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 graphene. And the reason for for exactly this combination is that. Boron nitride got a very very similar structure as uh, as as uh, uh, as graphene. In just instead of carbon uh, in the honeycomb lattice, you got boron and a slate, uh, uh, just alternating boron and and nitrogen. And even the lattice constants of these of these two crystals are very very close to 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 each other. There is only one point eight percent difference. And uh, in fact, um, so you uh, so you won't be able to see at this at this picture. So I need to exaggerate it by eleven percent to see that uh, the two crystals are not are not the same. But immediately you would see that uh, once you uh, once uh, the two crystals the two periodicities are not the same, you get the formation of the so-called um, or uh, Moira pattern. And this Mora pattern is 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 extremely important for uh, for those heterostructures because it, it gives you yet another periodicity, a new periodicity, and then electron scattering on this periodicity modifies quite strongly the the electronic structure of those of, of those crystals. So as I said, the uh, so historically it's been. Uh, studied for the first studied for the combination of graphene and boron nitride. So here, if you align the two crystals perfectly, because the lattice constant are slightly different, you get the uh, period of this Moira lattice or of the Moira uh, periodicity is is about fourteen nanometer. But if you rotate it further, you get uh, you very very quickly go to very low periodicity. To the to the point when at 90 degree rotation you you get you, you get a completely aperiodic structure and then and and um, well you get the super uh, you, you get the quasi crystal though it's uh, probably you get quasi crystal even for for the perfect orientation as well but um, but. Uh, 40 nanometer is quite is already quite quite measurable. It's indeed has been measured by many many people by very different technique. And as I said, uh, the importance of this more pattern is that electrons do scatter 
in uh, on 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 such a such a pattern and scattering of electrons on such a pattern uh, uh, immediately reconstructs the electronic spectrum. So now in, in, instead of the of these beautiful Dirac cones, which we usually draw for graphene, we get some complications in the spectrum. So Wonder Vals, um, Wonder Vals, uh, uh, sorry, some uh, one half singularities and the formation of the so-called secondary Dirac uh, Dirac points and secondary Dirac bands, like tertiary Dirac bands, and, uh, and so on. So uh, it has been seen uh, experimentally, so it's quite well. Uh, established and, and understood uh, understood physics and uh, the the real beauty starts when you be able to fit uh, electron uh, sorry magnetic flux quanta inside inside of such a plaquette because if you get uh, if you get flux quanta pure periodicity of the electron you can basically introduce new quasi particles which uh, don't know anything about this which is electron plus the flux quanta and those quasi particles would won't feel the magnetic field at all so you, you basically get a, 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 a fractal structure of the hofstadter, hofstadter butterfly which was very very brilliantly um, measured by uh, by by several several groups so it's really a beautiful effect and what i wanted to say that it's uh, some um, some um, quasi-classical analogy of this survives up to uh, up to room temperature. So you can see this those oscillations, those quantum oscillations up to uh, up to uh, up to room up to room temperature. Um, just a couple of words about the 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 uh, fabrication of those of those uh, structures. You basically typically you what you do you take. Um, some plastic stamp, a piece of uh, flexible plastic, and uh, try to attach or lift uh, a two-dimensional crystal from the from the surface of a silicon silicon oxide with your uh, with this with this stamp, and um, and uh, you by by doing it several times, you can create quite complex heterostructures. And if you align those crystals, you can get this uh, aligned more 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 a pattern if you want um in, in principle it's possible to do in situ alignment so and there are a number of uh, attempts a number of papers on this both from columbia from from manchester when people come with the uh, soft uh, soft cantilever and can and can attach in situ to the to the uh, to those crystals and then you can you can rotate it uh, uh, and adjust the angle and here the the fact that misaligned crystals they have the the benefit from the uh, superlibricity so they rotate quite quite easily or you can or you can even uh, you can even even move it uh, in, uh, in 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 space as well Again, easier to move in the in the uh, superlibritic uh, uh, in the uh, when they are in the superlibricity uh, regime. Uh, but also, there are attempts to grow such a, such aligned uh, aligned uh, heterostructures. So here is an example of um, of um, of our collaboration with the. Uh, uh, Jean von Leeuw group. So the Jean von Leeuw uh, uh, were, were uh, trying to uh, grow those uh, those aligned heterostructures between uh, between two graphene layers and to obtain a more pattern between those those uh, those graphene layers by interrupting, stopping, and interrupting uh, interrupting. Um, the growth of uh, of of graphene, and uh, during the interruption, you basically nucleate the uh, additional crystals. With if you nucleated a, a, a different spot, you would get you would get a different orientation, and indeed you can get quite quite a variety of 
a different Moira pattern. It's difficult to control it, but, uh, but still it's, uh, you can actually grow and then, and then pick up later those which, which, uh, which, which you require. So, but of course, the major boost was given to this wall field when three, three or four years ago now, the, um, um, the group, the MIT group, uh, uh, created twisted uh, bilayography bile when um, when you uh, uh, when you create a more pattern uh, between two graphene layers, and then the due to surface reconstruction as well as the uh, as the interaction between those those two those two layers you get completely flat bands and once you get flat bands they are very very prone immediately very prone to the to many many body uh, electronic effects electron electron correlation effects and through this way you basically can get uh, superconducting behavior but also also more more uh, insulating the behavior so in uh, twisted monolayer by layer we can see, so we can observe the uh, ferromagnetic behavior as well. So it's quite a powerful uh, technique. And these days, a lot of work, of course, devoted to uh, to to this to this topic. But what I wanted to talk about today more is um, going a little bit beyond this and uh, show what, how can we modify the properties of other heterostructures, other crystals, uh, with this, with with the same, uh, with the same idea of uh, of the stacking of the uh, of the two D crystals uh, uh, under controlled under controlled angle. So I will give you three uh, three examples of such uh, of such effects where we can we can really modify strongly the properties of those of those 2D crystals. And the first example is the, is the insulator, it's the, uh, it's the boron nitride. And uh, as I said, boron nitride is uh, very similar to graphene. So it has the hexagonal lattice. So we have uh, alternating boron, boron nitrogen. And um, the, uh, in nature, uh, boron, boron and, and nitrogen in the adjacent level, uh, layers uh, stick in such a way that boron is always on top of nitrogen and nitrogen on top of boron. So uh, they they basically, this covalent, this covalent bond they, it's uh, being compensated. So overall, uh, the, uh, the lack of the center of symmetry in the monolayer is compensated through uh, 180 degree rotation from one layer to another. But in principle, what we can do, we can, uh, stick those and stack those layers in such a way that uh, every next one is basically uh, uh, is in the same position as as the as the previous one. And then what you what you get is the strong reconstruction first of all. So the system try to enlarge one type of domains and decrease the other type of domains. But also those domains start uh, start to have ferroelectric ferroelectric properties. So simply by uh, combining crystals with without center of symmetry, we can get uh, we, we, we can get ferroelectric materials. So in principle, if you want a ferroelectric layer in your uh, in your uh, in your stack, you basically can get uh, can, can get uh, 180 degree rotated uh, boron nitride or any other uh, crystal without, without the, the, the uh, center of symmetry. So again, here is the example of different kinds of, kinds of domains in hexagonal boron nitride. So the different color is the different polarization of the, of the, of the, of the ferroelectric domains. Now, um, another example is uh, we're, we're going in terms of increasing conductivity. So we're getting now into the semiconducting uh, materials. And this work was done in collaboration with, uh, with Professor Shin from, uh, from UNIS 
and Sasha Altakovsky in, in Sheffield basically it became possible because of the uh, mass production, CVD production of the high quality, um, high quality uh, semiconducting layers. That's uh, molybdenum the selenite and tungsten the sulfide. So mono layers of those semiconducting materials are, are usually quite strongly, strongly luminescent. So you can see that they they just they luminesce so white and red for tungsten the, the sulfide. But the moment we stick them together and we overlap them on top of each other, the luminescence scratches. So you see those those black uh, black. Um, black triangles, and the reason for that is that uh, you you form the indirect excitants now because all the holes, uh, all the excited holes get uh, are collected in molybdenum, the selenite electrons in tungsten, the sulfide. So you basically get your uh, electron hole pair living in different layers, and that's and that gives you the this um, this. Offset for the uh, for the um, uh, for for the formation of the indirect excitant. But what uh, what uh, people note is that uh, as you rotate the 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 the, two, the orientation of the of the two crystals, the peak position of the of this indirect excitant changes quite uh, quite significantly, and the and the reason. It does it. It's because uh, once you get to the perfect alignment, the the uh, indirect excitant start to uh, start to interact or, and hybridize with the uh, with the direct excitant in molybdenum the selenide, and that's and, and that basically um, uh, creates a hybrid a hybrid excitant and the uh, and uh, so it, it it modulates the wave function of this excitant in the more in the more structure, and that that what 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 gives you this um, this strong dependence on the position and the amplitude of the peak on the on the relative orientation between these these two uh, two crystals. And um, another example I also wanted to uh, I wanted to give. Is the is the twisted uh, superconductors, and this work uh, became possible through the uh, advances of the, in the technology, which was done by the group of Liu John here uh, in Singapore, who basically can produce stable suspensions of many many different transition uh, metal nitrocarbonides, including niobium diselenide. Which was really, uh, which really was uh, surprising because um, because generally niobium diselenide is a very 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 tricky material to work with. It oxidizes immediately. So we uh, started working with niobium diselenide back in two thousand five, and it never not only superconduct never conduct and then every basically two years I was coming back to it and was trying to improve the technology to make it superconducting and it never worked until uh, uh, until Yan Cao and uh, Roman Gorbachev introduced the uh, glove box um, encapsulation of those of those materials and um, and then the encapsulated nerve the, the, the selenide uh, actually, uh, we we managed to uh, to make it to, to make it uh, superconducting. But even then, the superconductivity is quite weak. The bulk superconductivity for niobium diselenide, uh, the TC is is around seven Kelvin. In uh, in our monolayer, it really fell fell down to to below below two. Two Kelvin, so the 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 quality was still was already quite good. So it was superconducting, which was great, but it wasn't. It, it was still there was still room for for the improvement. The methodology which was introduced by Liu Zhong groups was uh, such that you basically during the exfoliation you also graft your material with some with the protective layer of the of the solvent of the of the propylene 
carbonate, and then it protects it from the uh, from the from the uh, oxidation. The beauty is that when you try to create a heterostructure, uh, the heterostructure itself cleans cleans it from the from uh, from this protective layer. It is the so-called the self-cleaning or self uh, self self-cleansing mechanism, uh, which uh, which basically uh, allows you to get. Uh, absolutely clean interface because the van der Waals interaction between those two two 2D crystals is by far stronger than uh, the interaction with the uh, organic molecules on the surface and those organic molecules just pushed away collapse collapses into those those pockets it doesn't work on any arbitrary uh, combination of, of surfaces like mica obviously won't work it is very hydrophilic water would never get pushed out of it some some other as well but luckily it does work for the uh, for meribium the selenide and here we created a la uh, uh, areas uh, the overlapping areas between different different flakes and then if you put contacts around it you can actually put, send current either across this this uh, overlapping area or across the the pure flake and the the quality is in principle very high that even the monolayer uh, monolayer no the, the, the selenite gives you the uh, tc of, of above three kelvin which is probably limited by the by some uh, fundamental uh, fundamental uh, uh, reasons and now what we do we just measure the dependence of the uh, critical current across the non-overlapping area and across the overlapping area. So in the non-overlapping in the non-overlapping area, there should be quite weak dependence of the of the uh, of the uh, critical current on the applied magnetic field, and that's exactly what we what we observed. But if you get into the overlapping area like this, so you get strong jumps and strong oscillations of the of the critical current as a function of, of magnetic field. And the reason for that is that uh, you basically form this, this, this uh, more pattern um, of the, this more pattern uh, of the, uh, of different stacking. And of course, different stacking would give you different TC. So you basically form strong and weak uh, superconducting areas, which is equivalent as having the uh, Josephson junctions. So now we have an array of the Josephson junctions, and it has this periodic uh, dependence of the critical of the critical current on the on the apply on the applied uh, applied magnetic field. So that's so th this is another another example how the uh, uh, the control of the orientation between different layers allows you to control the physical properties of the of those uh, of those uh, heterostructures so i think i will i will stop here i don't want to go to uh, to to talk to the topic which we are uh, working on now it's about fun let, let let me leave the topic of the functional intelligent materials which we are, are working on right now in our group in Singapore for the next seminar, so it's a big it's a big story uh, in its own right. So it has already a number of results there, and I'll just leave the conclusions here. And uh, thank you for your uh, for your attention, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss it on the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go on to the panel, we have some uh, questions from our audience. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Lily at Princeton. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm interested in the current quality of graphene. In terms of electronic properties, such as mobility, et cetera, how does the graphene compare to conventional semiconductor materials and also to the theoretical limits for graphene? I right, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good question. And uh, so uh, it's, Unfortunately, there is no 
short okay the, the short answer is that it's definitely by far better than uh, than any other uh, semiconductor materials the reason first of all i mean it it sounds a little bit maybe naive but it is it is true there are two reasons for that uh, the first reason is that still uh, most people try to work with monocrystalline materials and it would be maybe un un unfair to compare uh, graphene, which we use in in the uh, in our day-to-day -day experiments, which are always, almost almost always monocrystalline, and the uh, silicon, which is which might be after processing and doping and so on, might might introduce some uh, some some defects, some dislocations, may, maybe. The second reason is that we pretty much never dope graphene. We only dope it with uh, with with gating and silicon. You would get you would get um, you would get always some 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 dopants, which which reduces the uh, the the mobility. And the and the third reason is that carbon carbon bonds are extremely steep. So you uh, the temperature pretty much doesn't degrade the uh, the mobility at all, whereas in most other semiconducting materials you get very very like in gallium arsenide you get very strong dependence of the mobility on the uh, on the uh, on uh, on the uh, on uh, the um, uh, on 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 temperature now maybe a couple of words in, in terms of numbers right so the uh, say record high uh, record high um, mobilities for for graphene is probably a, a few millions uh, so of course they uh, it's still not as good as uh, as a record high for for gallium arsenide at low temperature which is maybe 20, 30 millions, but the moment temperature goes up, this one million for uh, for graphene stays, and in principle, you can get uh, close to a million uh, mobility at even at room temperature, which of course you cannot get with 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 any other uh, any other uh, material. So silicon is usually you're lucky if there's a few thousand, right? So hemmed devices, so it's it may be 50, 50 70 thousand. So um, it's uh, it's so in terms of mobility. So graphene is doing really is doing really great, especially room temperature mobility. But we need to be very careful uh, that we don't compare uh, oranges and apples. So so a part of mobility there are there are many other. Uh, important parameters, and uh, so, for example, the high frequency operations with with with, gra with, with graphene, it's uh, in terms of mobility, it's great, but it just loses in terms of the contact resistance, for example. So um, there are always long answers and the and the fine print there, unfortunately. Very good. The second question comes from Jing and uh, Chengdu. Uh, magic angle graphene opens a new window for materials research and development. Can you comment on the future of this research and possible commercialization? Oof. I mean, honestly, so that was, I was trying to put it as the main message of my, all my talk, that's the uh, twist orientation and twist control of the, of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the properties, electron, special electron, electronic properties of those materials is really a powerful, a powerful technology. So, and uh, I agree. So the twist, the magic angle graphene is uh, is really exciting breakthrough. And uh, but uh, similarly with many other uh, other two D materials, you get. Uh, you get into very unusual, uh, unusual um, structures. So people are now working on twisted magnetic uh, heterostructures, and you get you start to get very uh, unusual uh, magnetic uh, states, sometimes correlated states. So 
uh, I, I think it is it, it, in terms of in terms of research, it's really uh, unbelievably huge uh, range for 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 work, and it's very exciting to 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 work in this area. In terms of the applications, well, it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I would like to uh, to 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 say but the, to, to answer this by the by the words words of uh, Arthur Clark who, who said that in terms of the forecast uh, usually our our uh, predictions at the end turn out to be laughably conservative so currently it's uh, uh, very delicate experiments on this on this twist angle materials graphene or or not, or not graphene. So they're very, uh, you, so you need to be very dedicated and it's a, it's a bit, it might be a bit, a bit tricky. At the same time, I remember myself at the beginning of graphene era. And then when people were asking, so can you, can we, are we going to, to, to be using graphene for any application? I, I would always say, of course not, come on. We get it by scorch tape, how can you use it? So, and just a couple of years later, I was proven wrong. So I can imagine that we can, for example, piezoelectric materials with boron nitride are very, very easy to obtain. Maybe we can use it for, for, for some applications. And, uh, and I can imagine that, that there would be other uh, heterostructures where we can control properties by twist angle and, and which we can use in applications in the near future. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and, you know, I really appreciate you accepting to come back and give another talk on your on your current efforts. We will definitely right. hold you do that and, okay. and book you for more of this amazing science that you've, uh, you've brought to us. Uh, let me now uh, introduce our panel. Let's go on to the next slide. Our first panelist is Professor Zhang Chun Tian of Xiamen University. Uh, Professor Tian's research focuses on uh, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, spectroelectrochemistry, plasmonics, and nanochemistry. He's a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences. He's currently the director of the Fujian Science and Technology Innovation Laboratory for Energy Materials and the immediate past president of ISE. He's an associate editor for Science in China Chemistry and Chem Society Reviews. Our next panelist is Professor Meng Lianzhu, uh, who's a professor of nanoscience at the National University of Defense Technology. He got his PhD with Professor Novoselov and Professor Andrei Gaim. His main research interests are quantum optoelectronics based on graphene, 2D materials, and van der Waals heterostructures, and carbon-based functional materials and nanodevices. Uh, Dr. Zhu is the editor of the Journal of Semiconductors. And our third panelist is Professor Deblina Sarkar, who's an assistant professor and at and Career Development Chair Professor at the MIT Media Lab, where she heads the Nano-Cybernetic Biotrack Research Group. Her group focuses on engineering, applied physics, and biology to bridge the gap between nanotechnology and synthetic biology to develop disruptive technologies for nanoelectronic devices and life machine symbioses. As she's one of Technology Review's top 10 innovators under 35 from India. It's won many other awards, some of which have not quite been announced yet, and one of which she doesn't know about yet. <laughs> and then our ex challenger for today is Dr. Chuan Shen Du of the University of British Columbia. Dr. Du received his PhD from the Material Science and Engineering Department at Iowa State. He's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Chemical and Biological Engineering Department at UBC. His research focuses on functional surface interface engineering and analysis of engineering of systems with many components. So welcome everybody. And as is our tradition, we'll start with our ex-challenger, Dr. Du. All right, thank you. Uh, I will start with a rather Basic question. So, in your talks, so you mentioned that one in one at one point you mentioned that different stackings of 
the two uh, layer of the 2D materials will like in the superconducting part, it will lead to different TCs. I would imagine that is probably due to uh, the materials are not equally happy when they're stacking or their orientation is slightly different. So uh, combining that with the second part, which is the stacking and orientation forming the more uh, patterns, uh, would you envision that there will be a limit on how many layers that you can stack and orient slightly differently and utilize the new properties formed by this more uh, structure? Well, that's a, it's a very good question. And frankly speaking, uh, I don't think we've got a complete understanding of the, of the, of the stacking process at all. Uh, for example, just let me start with some, with some basics. And, and uh, uh, for example, we, we say that uh, once we stack, we, uh, we get this Moira pattern. And this Moira pattern, we've got, we've got certain, certain, uh, certain periodicity. In fact, of course, uh, it shouldn't because um, once, you, once you stack two, two crystals or the same crystal under some, some angle, you should get, a, a, in fact, a, a quasi-crystal because it's only very, very limited number of, uh, of, of, of angles which would, would, would give you commensurate structure and would give you periodic structure. There are more irrational number than rational number, so, so most of the, of the stacking would, should, should result in, um, uh, in uh, in quasi crystals, in, in reality, of course, what ha what happens is that uh, in in the most interesting cases, and why uh, why uh, magic angle works, that uh, you get uh, crystal reconstruction, and how this this reconstruction works, it's uh, um, I, 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 I'm not sure anyone really. Understand. So myself, I, I used to you know, play with this toy model, Frankel Cantarola model, which is sort of that, very similar to 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 this stacking, but it's a it's it's a very powerful, very simple model in um, for the uh, one-dimensional domain walls, and you can uh, within this model you can get uh, the the solitons, the breezes, the kings, uh, and so on. And uh, but but now we have similar structure in 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 two dimensions, and even in the static state, you might get some uh, doubling of the period of this of this more structure, maybe maybe something else. Uh, at, at some moment, I I unfortunately wasted one year of one of my PhD students on trying to search for a dynamic effects in such a, in such. Uh, in such uh, more more patterns, so um, uh, so I, I don't think we we uh, we fully appreciate the complexity of the of this of the stacking, but uh, so but there are some very interesting effects which are related to, for example, um, uh, for example, uh, strain effects. Because once you stack those crystal, they the, you, you, the crystal reconstruction would immediately create huge strain, uh, strain fields. In, you can imagine in uh, uh, crystals like uh, boron nitride or uh, molybdenum disulfide, which don't, which lack the center of symmetry, you would start getting, uh, getting piezoelectric fields. So, it's. I think the the physics of this stacking is far really really far away from uh, from being completely understood so and uh, I mean we've been working and playing with this boron nitride graphene structures from which we uh, all of us started this uh, this orientation control story a long time ago and we've been playing it for like more than 10 years now and we're still uh, far away from from complete understanding so that's that's a little bit of a general answer. I, I can we can go into detail of, of of every single case, but as I said, unfortunately, there are still so many details. And in we do know the 
type of experiments where we can amplify those details and make them major, major, um, uh, major effects. And uh, so it, it's really, the effects become really, really beautiful. Uh, thank you. And another simpler question, I guess. So, uh, in a, again, the earlier part, you mentioned that aside from the perfect the two dimensional structures like graphenes, we can also uh, tune the structures of those graphenes and make them functional, like the futures you mentioned. Can we stack them as well? And how would you engineer the interfaces between such a structure? Um, okay, again, a very good question. That's actually the, I would leave it as a subject for my next, next talk, because we try to now create interfaces between, uh, between 2D crystals and non-periodic systems like, uh, for example, polymers or poly, poly electrolytes. But, uh, but there are uh, other type of considerability start to play a role. So you basically try to pack as many of those, uh, of those polymers on the surface to create a close packing. And so it's, so there is, there are commensurate effects, but they are of different types. Uh, then I'm sure that there are orientational effects between those polymers and, and, and 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 uh, well and and the surface, uh, but it's it's slightly different type of the uh, effects, um, and then especially if you create if you use some dynamic polymers like polyelectrolytes, which can really readily change their configuration depending on the uh, environment, for example pH or temperature or illumination, you get some some interesting. Um, reconstruction uh, effects when when you when the the commensurate states change depending on the conditions. So I, I probably that's not what you meant. Uh, so the answer to your question would be probably no. But but there are still uh, still examples of commensurate structure between uh, between aperiodic uh, aperiodic structures like. Uh, polymers and 2D materials. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. Let's move on to Professor Sarkar. Hey, Konstantin, very exciting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so I think following up uh, on the previous question, so regarding the you know orientation, I think that can have really exciting uh, applications. So do you think this can be done at a wafer scale? Well, that's that's of course uh, that, that's of course the uh, the big topic for for research and the big the big goal. And uh, I showed. The example of work. So many many groups are trying to do it. So I, I showed you a very successful work by Jean Liu group from Peking University, who is trying to uh, grow uh, grow stacks of those of, the, of those materials. Um, another another very nice example is the growth by MBE of uh, graphene boron nitride interfaces and they they grow into something something very interesting they, they grow completely commensurate on huge areas like hundreds of microns and then and then suddenly they can because they, they grow at, at high temperature and then the smallest disruption makes them collapse and, and just move on the surface. And those are microscopic movements. So it's, uh, uh, it's really, uh, really marvelous to see. So it's, it's quite an unusual effect. So we, we're used to, to the systems which you grow and they're more or less stable. And here you grow them and they, and they, and, and they, and they, are, they are alive. Another interesting um, direction, which is, uh, not that many pay, uh, not that many much literature uh, many literature exist is the um, uh, is the solution growth because in prince in many areas 
for example, quantum dots, you can grow small areas, quantum dots of 2, 2, 2D materials. And in principle, you would benefit from growing even simple heterostructures, maybe like two layers or three layers of those quantum dots. And it is possible to do it, uh, to do it in solution. And uh, when they grow, they would more or less necessarily uh, be aligned. How, I have no idea, but somehow they would, they would probably try to be aligned. But uh, there, are, there are only really countable number of papers on, on, on such structures. So there are efforts, there is limited success, but uh, of course we would like to see more, more, more examples. Okay, great. Yeah, another question that I have, I think that's really cool. You showed that you could actually have grown graphene from blood, right? Basically any material which has carbon, you right. can get um, graphene and you could get it, you know, uh, with iron because you're getting it from blood. So I was wondering this um, other elements that get integrated, uh, is it like more through intercalation between layers of graphene or you can, you know, uh, replace one of the carbon atoms with, um, you know, these other elements? Well, you know, uh... Uh, Monday morning, my blood contains all, all, all sort of stuff. So you can you can probably grow grow very very strange heterostructures. Yeah, that's true. After uh, after the weekend, but um, uh, but uh, uh, indeed, so the um, the intercalation of uh, of those crystals, and not only not only graphene, but intercalation mm -hmm. of the other crystals. Is uh, is a very powerful technique because intercalation of of, of graphite was very popular uh, back in maybe seventies, and so this it's uh, famous books of Dressel House and Dressel House. That's uh, it's uh, it's it's the bible for uh, for many of us. But now we 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 start to uh, we start we are trying to control. Uh, the properties of, of, of those materials with, uh, uh, on, on the finer level, and you can try to make it, uh, so there are groups like Nina Grigorio and Manchester is trying to make it uh, ferromagnetic. And so that would be, that would be uh, very, very interesting as well. But we also try to uh, intercalate uh, uh, other, other materials with, uh, with, uh, with different ions. And then um, another uh, another the direction is that, in principle, in layered materials, those intercalated ions are mobile. So, uh, for you can easily uh, in the electrochemical setup, and it can be even solid electrolyte. You can drive those ions in and those ions out, and. Uh, uh, ions in, ions out would create a huge change in the work function, uh, in the uh, in the work function of those materials. Like maybe half electron volt, maybe even even larger. So, the, or you can control optical properties. You can control the radiation properties. So, it's uh, I think the doping is uh, and and I mean doping by itself is a is a is a big story because. The why 2D semiconductors are, are, are important because graphene, unfortunately, it's optically uh, unactive. So it's great material, good fun, but you can't do much optically with it. That's why uh, lots of people work on, uh, on transition metal tetrachloride. Optics there is really fantastic. You work in the K point, so you have spin orbit. You can spin control uh, with the with the polarization and so on but you have still countable number of those of those materials i don't know okay maybe 10 12 so but it's still individual lines in the optical spectrum but now what what we do we create uh, alloys and uh, you tactics out of out, out of those and if you if you do that you can really position the the band gap pretty much anywhere you want and you can control with the heavy elements the spin orbit coupling so i think the technology of these materials is only uh, will 
will be starting on it and uh, it's uh, uh, it's really good fun you know. great Paul, is there time for another question I can ask or we should move to the next panelist? Is I when think you we can... better go to the next panelist because sure, we have two sure. more plus Thanks one more question. audience question, but uh, we will bring uh, uh, Gustia back <laughs> as he offered. Uh, let's move on to Professor Shu now. Professor Shu, yeah. Are you asking? Uh, Meng Jie, you did not. Admit your milk, yeah. Jeff. Okay. Hey, right. So, hi, Kostya. Hi, it's Jeff. good. To, it's it's good to see see you all now. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. At, uh, there are many update exciting applications. So I will ask a few questions from the point of view of the realistic applications. So the first one is for photonics. So you quickly mentioned the exciting application based on graphene and silicon modulate, right? So actually, there are many exciting fundamental researches on TMDCs and graphene, but for applications, because the light matter interaction, like scale, is too short in, in, in 2D materials, especially in the moral layer limit, so because the wavelength of the light is, is, is like thousands of nanometers. It's three order for magnetic larger than, than 2D materials. So this is the absorption of light in 2D materials is so low. Also, it's, it's bottlenecked the, the quantum yield of, of light source. So it's the only scenario or application that we have to use like atomic resin membranes for photonics, like, right. like electronics. Yeah, you are absolutely right. That was that's the that's the concern. I mean, in fact, uh, the the uh, the value per layer for graphene two point three percent is not that small. It's actually quite large for a monolayer. Yes, but yes. but you're right. For a thin material, you basically it's nothing. So you 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 need the depth of the modulation hundred uh, percent. Otherwise, it's it's very leaky. It's same problem as with the with the transistor with the graphene transistor application. It always conduct. You cannot make it conducting less than 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 the than the conductivity quantum. And that's why uh, I think the combination of the way of the waveguide and graphene, in fact, um, uh, and okay, let's say, and graphene is the is the ideal because you basically. Put graphene on top of the of the of the wave guy and the wave uh, and the wave and you uh, and you uh, make it interact on on a long on a long distance. It's only evanescent wave, of course, but but still you can get quite a deep a deep modulation even in in absorption. In fact, uh, nobody realistically is going to use absorption for for. for for these kind of devices, it's much much more economical to use uh, to use phase change because you can yes. you can phase phase modulate in such uh, in such uh, in such devices, and then you can uh, so it works it works much better. And maybe the last comment: so it, it did it did start it, it this uh, this story did start with with graphene, and uh, I, I've seen. Ericsson demonstrating on the uh, on their conferences the real real modules with graphene implemented for the 5G application and so on, but realistically, uh, two uh, 2D semiconductors actually offer much much better performance because the band gap is just slightly larger than the than. Uh, than the silicon silicon wave guide, so there are no losses at all whatsoever, and but there is quite a strong uh, a strong um, uh, a strong phase modulation when you dope when you dope uh, semiconductor. So it's it's quite a unique situation that you you don't want you you don't get any absorption at all. You only modu modulate. Uh, modulate uh, the refractive index, the refractive the refractive e index, and that's the ideal situation for the system when the the, the losses are zero, but the, the the modulation you can gain 
anything because you are in the uh, uh, interfer interferometry uh, scheme. Okay. Can I have one more question? Um, yeah, the second one is more fundamental. So as you mentioned, for those um, twist control everything in, in, in 2D materials, but, um, but I think from the point of solid state physics, so the key is not the twist, right? The key is the flat band, actually. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a key. Uh, I mean, right? a, a part of the a part of the Hofstadter physics, yes. Yeah, for the yeah. for the many body physics, it is it is the flat band, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. For the for the many body effect, so people find that because twist pilot is so hard to reproduce, it's so hard to 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 prepare. It's, it's from different from lab to lab. Um, now APC emerges. APC stack graphene, the Charlie graphene or Martinet graphene emerges as another candidate. So, but actually, bilayer graphene, like, like Bernal Stockholm bilayer graphene, if you open a gap uh, applying, after applying an electric field, the low energy dispersion is also quite flat, right? So, is there any, pos is there any possibility to find any strong correlated state in like Bernal stacking graphene? Because Bernal staking is the most stable phase of, of graphite. Is there any chance to looking forward in this system? Um, indeed, a very good question. And uh, there were, uh, and honestly, I mean, of course, it depends always between uh, on the relations between temperature and the and, and 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 the flatness of the bands. So, how deep in 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 temperature can you go? Uh, but in in fact, um, in the time before in the time uh, before boron nitride, it was uh, always the suspended suspended graphene, and there were several papers. Uh, including one of one of ours, but there are some. There, there were several other papers of the of the um, of the uh, lifting of the uh, trigonal warping degeneracy and 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 other many body effects in the in in bile in bile in bile graphene. Unfortunately, we switched quite quite quickly to the uh, to graphene on boron nitride. We got if you got other advantages and disadvantages still but uh, those effects which you are talking about they were observed in bile graphene though we need to uh, though we, we still have to be a bit careful because suspended devices there is strain and yeah. there are there might be there might be like some dislocations as well so we have to be a bit careful and take those those results with a pinch of salt but uh, so theoretically, yes, there were some experimental indications that indeed it does happen. So it's uh, it is it is uh, it is possible. But um, well, uh, I think I think uh, it might be a bit challenging to get to that to that regime in the with the bile, especially on the substrate. Thank you. Okay, I'll move to the next panelist. Yes, let's, uh, Professor Tian, it's uh, your turn. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank I, you for the invitation. And well, I, I think uh, young people can give a more sharp comment and question. For me, I only ask one general question um, mm -hmm. because I very much like uh, Kostya's uh, big point or biggest point for this lecture. That is, what is the right choice for the human regarding the uh, materials and chemical elements. Of course, uh, <laughs> and, and this is the, uh, a, big a big question. And regarding um, hetero um, structure or hybridization of um, 2D materials, for example. And I think it's quite complicated because of the term of uh, hybridization in chemistry and maybe in life science uh, is a good term. However, however, the reality is that the successful rate for hybridization 
is very low. It's very low. The people only show up those uh, good example, positive example. But if you think about, if you want to hybridize and kind of a different elements or, or, or different materials, and I believe that the uh, unsuccessful rate is very, very big. So that uh, it means that if we want to move on along this direction, the method or methodology of making hetero uh, structure or packing 2D materials must be very rationally designed and must be very thoughtful. So if we wanted to have a young generation to just uh, try this, uh, it seems uh, um, based on this uh, extremely high and successful rate. And uh, we have to think about other ways, for example, machine deep learning or some other ways that possibly can provide a big help to avoid a lot of uh, failure. So what do you think about this? Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah, Professor Tian, thank you so much for for this for this question, and I should probably let people know that uh, Professor Tian is a uh, is a long is a old friend of mine, and so we just, um, uh, just we do know each other for quite a long time, and I've got maybe three answers to this. So first of all, to the to the uh, remark that uh, that. Uh, we need to check what's the uh, uh, what's the optimal combination of the chemical elements for the human being. We probably I just offer, uh, let's try to ask all the all the panelists to to do blood analysis, and then I will update the our uh, this this um, this periodic table of elements from the humans, and I, I can make it even personalized. Uh, Professor Tian, Paul Wise. Jack and, and so on. So we can uh, we can uh, we can do it. Uh, but for um, so two answers. So one is you are absolutely right. The range of parameters and uh, uh, and um, uh, is is absolutely huge. And unfortunately, the this hybridization happens on the. Uh, level of the interaction, and this this is the Van der Waals interaction, which is which is very weak, and it's really really uh, only badly controlled, and uh, you can, it's very difficult to put it properly into uh, into, for example, DFT calculation. So we do know uh, uh, potentials for carbon, for boron, for nitrogen reasonably well. The moment you go beyond that, it's uh, it's becoming a mess. And uh, you're right that it's very challenging to predict this hybridization for for those 2D 2D materials. So so far, it's it it all has been done by the uh, by the intuition, and it's really so. That's the that's why we applaud the uh, intuition of Pablo Gerardo Herrera, who understood that. So if you get to the certain level of the interaction, the 25 um, uh, millivolt uh, of the Van der Waals would be enough to form the flat bands. So that's the so that's uh, that's the intuition uh, at work. But uh, you you're right. It's very it, it's very difficult uh, uh, to, to to get the intuition into more complex heterostructures or even even more similar heterostructures, but made of more uh, of of other elements. Which are heavy elements, but from another hand, what I would like to and again, it's a precursor for another lecture that uh, maybe we don't want those materials to be so rigid as as we as we are used uh, as we are used to. the The power of human being is exactly because we're so flexible that we are so temperature sensitive, pH sensitive, light sensitive, uh, and so on. So, and maybe the fact that, and I mean, we a, a lot of things are controlled on the Van der Waals and Coulomb, and Coulomb interaction inside, inside our body. So maybe it's not that bad that, that we have another system which, uh, which is sensitive to Van der Waals and, and Coulomb. And if we tune it, if we design it properly, we can make it, uh, agile at room temperature. 
Uh, well, it's uh, it's a bit of a dream, of course, because it's uh, for, it's 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 very difficult. But you are right; we are working on AI uh, for materials design, and especially these kind of agile uh, structures which change their conformation. We need dynamic AI, so that's a, that's another area of research we are involved. So we have very good. Uh, mathematicians in uh, here in, in Singapore working exactly on this area, dynamic AI. So it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's, it is really exciting. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. But uh, at least it will be the right, the right way forward. Okay. Thanks a lot, Kostya. Very good. And let's return to Professor Sarkar for a final question. Hey, Constantine. So the last question I'm going to ask is a little bit broad and maybe open-ended. Uh, so the applications of 2D materials are vast, the physics is rich, but is there any area that you think that has remained unexplored? So for example, you had been thinking about it, but didn't really get time to get into it. So if you had time and could put a superstar genius student, what area you would put uh, the student into? Well, I think uh, honestly there are many of such many of such areas, uh, but if I, if I need to think about something which I was excited about but 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 missed is probably the behavior of the freestanding uh, 2D 2D membrane. So it was bothering many people. Uh, on different level, on practical level, on the fundamental level, on the mathematical level, from the from the very beginning, how stable the the free freestanding two D crystal on the applied level, for example, people were speculating, can it be used as a razor and go, for example, through a lipid membrane and so on. So I think uh, just observing either in simulations or in, in real life, the behavior of this uh, flat membrane or curl, a curved membrane or how it can be influenced uh, in, its, in its shape would be, would be a cool thing. So something really for the retirement, I'm sure it's, it's, a, it's an open-end project, so, but, um, but uh, I think it, it still has a, a lot of opportunities maybe in terms of creating artificial membranes and, uh, and so on. Very exciting. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Let me thank all our panelists. Uh, we're a bit over time, but uh, of course, this is an exciting morning here, afternoon elsewhere, and the evening uh, around the world. Uh, you know, what we would really like to do is uh, walk over and you know, shake your hand and give you a plaque that, that uh, thanks you for giving this a wonderful lecture and uh, leading this discussion on uh, materials for the future. Uh, we hope to be able to do that in real life very soon, and I hope to see you in uh, Singapore and elsewhere around the world uh, as, the, as things reopen uh, later this year. In the meantime, please accept this electronic certificate and know that we've, uh, we are delighted to have you back uh, to continue on uh, discussing the work that you're on now. And so, you know, thank you so much for for uh, spending this time with us today. Oh, Alice, it was really, really great experience. Thank you so much. I, I, I never could understand how these panel things works, but it was, it was really good fun. Thank you. Thanks. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it, guys. Thank you so much, Professor Tian. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you Fantastic. so much. See you. Bye. <laughs> Very good. Bye. Bye, Kostya. Bye. And and next week, we'll be continuing uh, the uh, nanomaterials theme, and we'll be covering the world with Martin Turo at uh, Iowa State University and Mizo Kim at SKKU, uh, hosting uh, Si Hong Wang from the University of Chicago and Si Jung Kim from the University of Melbourne. So you know, please do come back for that. And we have a, an exciting program already covering the rest of the year. Thank you. And have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye.